kind of people are you? There's children here and you're shooting tear gas at us. We're not, we're not armed and you're aiming your weapons at us. What kind of people are you? There comes a time when you have to stand up for your rights and certainly uh, you have got that to the attention of the, the international community and hopefully that the government will start listening. With the discovery of the New World in 1492, a war began against the American Indians, against their culture, their language, and their religion. That war has continued until today, but now is entering a new phase. The first Europeans in the New World were greeted with curiosity and in many places with kindness. But the whites responded with an almost inconceivable brutality. These, said one, were the horrors of hell, hanging, disemboweling, burning alive. In 1542, Bartolomé de las Casas wrote, the Europeans have become so anesthetized to human suffering by their greed that they've ceased to be human in any meaningful sense of the word. They have honed to perfection the art of cruelty in order to wipe human beings from a large part of the globe. But the repression of the last 500 years has continued to meet resistance from the jungles of Amazonia to the cities of North America. Over this vast continent in the century after Columbus, it's estimated that nine-tenths of the native people died of war, famine, and disease. Whole peoples vanished forever. One of them was the owner in Tierra del Fuego. The owner were largely exterminated by European gold prospectors and sheep farmers a century ago. These last survivors were filmed in 1913. The British sheep ranchers who poured into owner lands said openly that a sheep was worth more than an Indian life. They hunted the owner like animals, even ripping open pregnant women to claim their one pound for a pair of owner ears or an Indian skull. Not one of the owner is alive today. Only their skulls remain as anthropological exhibits in Western museums. Attacks on Indians are still commonplace throughout South America. At Christmas 1991, 20 Indians from the Pais people in Colombia, including four women and four children, were murdered by land grabbers tied in with Colombia's heroin mafia. Murdered simply because they wouldn't vacate their land. Up in the north of Colombia, the Ica people lost three of their best leaders, their wise men, in December 1990, murdered by paramilitaries associated with the army and the big landowners. These violent events have brought the Indian peoples of Colombia together to petition the president himself. They got little sympathy. I have asked many people, even the very president of the republic, Cesar Gaviria Trujillo, to make the denouncement. In my statement, I said some of these words to the president. That's enough. For 500 years, that's enough. I said to him, what is our enormous sin? What is our enormous debt that we should deserve so much suffering in death, Mr. President? 
But his answer was very brief. Our statement was around 30 minutes, and he answered it in less than five minutes. Who, he asked, is the savage? Who is the savage? Who are the savages in this country? Is it us, or is it our adversaries? I understood it like that. According to them, civilization has advanced. If that is civilization, then we are in a bad way in this country. We are in a very bad way if civilization means to kill Indians. Never in my life did I imagine that you would be facing such a sad reality. Never. Pahasapa, the heart of the world, the Black Hills of Dakota, sacred spirit center for the Sioux Indians. In 1868, the Sioux signed the Fort Laramie Agreement with the US government, confirming their rights over the Black Hills. But six years later, gold was found there, and the forcible and illegal seizure of the land began. The Sioux resisted. Their enemies were men like General George Custer, an unprincipled and cold-blooded adventurer well known for his belief that Indians were less than human. In 1876, at Little Bighorn, the Sioux killed Custer. In this film reconstruction from 1908, the Sioux played themselves. After the defeat, the US government turned the full weight of its revenge on the Sioux. Within two weeks of Little Bighorn, the War Department was talking of a policy of extermination for the Indians. And the speedier, the better, it was said. The Fort Laramie Treaty was swiftly abrogated and the Black Hills duly annexed by the US government. But the story wouldn't go away. Despite the efforts of white culture through books, TV, and Hollywood to rewrite this history of injustice, a hundred years on from Fort Laramie, in 1968, the American Indian movement was founded, and a new phase opened in the history of Native American resistance. The idea for the movement probably came from 200 different minds and 200 different ideas and 200 years of, of abuse. Because it brought together people who were, who were tired, people who were, who were fed up, people who wanted to stand up and, and be heard. It brought together people who wanted to, who wanted to say something about this history. And it's, they wanted to, to do something for the future generation. In 1973, after the murder of two Indians in South Dakota, several hundred Indians and members of the new movement marched on Wounded Knee, scene of the notorious massacre of Indian women and children in 1890. There they took over the town in protest against the racism of the US government and the corrupt self-interest of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA. For 71 days, I never worried about a BIA person coming to tell me what to do, or a BIA police officer telling me what to do, or a BIA administration telling me what to sign or not sign, or what deed that could be uh, authorized, or what resolution was passed. No white person ever came anything uh, and came up to me and said anything to me about get moving or that this land is my land and you cut your land over there. And there was a sense of freedom, of really being free. And I didn't want to, I didn't want that to end. President Nixon's government surrounded Wounded Knee with FBI, US Marshals, and armed BIA police, the so-called goon squad.
They came with armored personnel carriers and enough hardware to wipe out every Indian in the Dakotas. The most powerful nation in the world had been challenged in its backyard by a tiny indigenous group demanding the return of its sovereignty over lands guaranteed by treaty a century before. The armed confrontation ended in stalemate. But afterwards, the traditional leaders of the Aglala Sioux, some of whose grandparents had killed Custer, called for discussion of the 1868 treaty on equal terms with the US. It was a symbolic moment for Indians right across the Americas. The Wounded Knee standoff struck a chord among many Indian peoples in North America, where the issue of land rights was now becoming explosive. As the consumer society tried to assert its rights to natural resources everywhere, even on reserved Indian lands. In Canada, the issue blew up over the barefaced expropriation of Mohawk sacred land for a golf course. This golf course, that's the root of all the evil, right there. That is, that is, that is, that is what our, that, that's what's killing our people. These people here who don't give a shit about playing, hitting a ball around the Denver field and don't give a shit about anybody's rights. On the, on, uh, no an Indian has a right on this, on the, this land. Well, that's got to change. It's Mohawk land, it's our land. Th there's a little bit left. They're sucking the marrow out of our bones. That's, that's obviously what they, they all want. They want everything. We treat these trees and the land like our mother. These people are raping our mother. What would you do if they raped your mother? We're saving it. We're here to protect this part of our territory for future generations that are coming. The children who, have, who are unborn. And the, children, the children's children who are here now because that was done for us. The planned golf course was the baby of the mayor of Oka, who had a French-speaking and often anti-Indian constituency. He refused to negotiate with the Mohawk demonstrators. And in their frustration, they responded with violent protest. The state premier, Robert Bourassa, was then asked to bring in the heavily armed Quebec state security police. With that, the die was cast for confrontation. They've not listened to our requests, and it's brought us to this point where people's lives are at stake. If he thinks that he can wash his hands clean of this affair, he is sorely mistaken. The North American democracies are at least publicly accountable for how they use force in their own lands. In South America, the armed forces have been all too willing to murder Indians throughout their history. In December 1990, in Colombia, three leaders of the Ica people were killed by paramilitaries in league with the Colombian army. They were on their way to meet government officials in Bogota to talk about health and education provisions and about land rights. The whites who murder Indians, why do they do it? The Indians don't do them any harm. There is no point to it. Why do they feel that they must kill them like that? There is no reason. They do it just because they feel like it. 
For example, when there is a snake lying down, we beat it to death with sticks or stones, for the simple reason that a snake represents a danger. So, with the same logic, they've been killing us, with the difference that in our case, they are driven by their own perversion and savagery, without needing any reason. We live humbly, we have no weapons, we represent no danger. But they, through their pride of owning so many things, attack us as if we are of no value. The three murdered leaders had been taken off their bus, brutally tortured and literally cut to pieces their dismembered bodies left by the roadside. An echo of the horrors described by Las Casas. Horrors all too deeply ingrained in the Indian experience. This time, though, the Ica had had enough. They marched en masse into the provincial capital in protest. And Vicente, one of their leaders who survived torture, spoke out in public about his ordeal. At 11 o'clock at night, they raided my house in Garupal. I was dragged by my hair with two revolvers at my head. I was taken to the army barracks, La Popa. They blindfolded me immediately and put me down a well to force me to say what they wanted me to say. And I asked, what must I say? They said, where are you holding Matos, the landowner hostage? If I didn't tell them, they said they would kill me. So you will kill an innocent person, but I know nothing. At that moment, a man arrived in civilian clothes. He kicked my face and punched me, shouting, where are you holding the landowner? He put a revolver in my mouth and said if I didn't tell him, he would kill me and all my family. After their protest, the Ica returned home to perform the ancient rites for the dead. The three weeks of prayers and rituals will put the wandering souls of the murdered men to rest and let their spirits ascend to the mountain peaks. He had many friends, very good relations with the entire community, and served his people. Then, all of a sudden, he was lost forever. That is the memory we shall always have of him. We have not the least idea why all this happened. Because he had no enemies, nor was there anything one could reproach him for. He lived the life of a leader, giving good advice and guidance. While everyone saw in him a person who gave so much service, yet he disappeared while following that path. So, what can I say? We feel as if all of a sudden everything went into darkness.
Why do they think that we Indians do not feel that death when they know that the Indians have existed forever and they have always tried to do away with them? Isn't that true? When they see that the Indians are so strong, that they withstand so much, that they don't allow themselves to be wiped out, and they show that they possess firmness and strength. So, why do they think that we do not have feelings? Simply because we are Indians? Indians, we are rational beings. We have such great feelings that they cannot possibly imagine it. And the fact that we react so strongly is something else. We also have feelings. day with some clouds today July 11th and it's a Wednesday there the temperature now is 19 degrees it should be a high of 24 degrees the record high for this day it was in 1987 was 32 degrees and Janet are you there I am here how's it going out there uh, well we've got to, we've got a lot of traffic problems this morning uh, for people who are just waking up uh, the Mercier Bridge has been blocked off by the Kanawaki Warriors cannot get anywhere near it. Uh, they have put up barricades and then uh, provincial police... Uh, As the confrontation over the golf course grew more and more serious, the Ganawaki, cousins of the Oka Mohawk, came to their aid. They blocked one of the main commuter bridges into Montreal, a bridge which they had built and which ends up on their reservation. We're just going to have to break away for a minute. We have to go to Ivan Slobod, who's out at the uh, blo blockade in Oka. I don't know if you can hear any of that. Yes, it right. sounds like shots. Uh, they launched, uh, oh, I don't know, about uh, half a dozen or a dozen canisters of tear gas. There's smoke covering, uh, I don't know, a 30 or 40 square meter area. A report is... Are those shots, Ivan? Hello? I could see the smoke blowing that way towards the road. And they started coming over, just like on TV. They started coming over. And I saw them, and I said, they're coming in, they're coming in. And then It was, a, it was at that point that they, uh, they opened fire. Uh, we, we, we really didn't expect it. You know, uh, from the beginning we expected a confrontation, but we didn't expect the uh, intensity of the attack. We, we expected to be met with a riot squad or dogs or something and be dragged away, which we were perfectly willing to be get arrested in that. The bullet holes in the trees are at chest level. There's no way that they weren't shooting to kill us. In fact, only one person died in the confrontation, a policeman. It was never confirmed whether he was killed by the warriors or by police fire. We must never forget, ladies and gentlemen, that this land was once home of proud Indian people. The reserve is called Cognawaga. The Indians call it Kanawaki. They are Mohawk Indians belonging to the Iroquois family. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Through a long hot summer, white anger grew, first burning Indian effigies and then spilling out onto the streets in violent clashes with the Quebec State Police. People boiling with frustration at two-hour journeys each way every day to work. In this atmosphere, the racism towards Indians came right out into the open. Eventually, the Quebec Premier, Robert Bourassa, asked the Canadian Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, to send in troops. And 5,000 men, more than Canada sent to the Gulf War, moved in against the Mohawk at Oka and Mercier Bridge. Just as with the Sioux at Wounded Knee, a Western liberal democracy had publicly and embarrassingly deployed massive force to quell the legitimate protest of its own dispossessed minority. History simply would not lie down. The Mohawk women and children were evacuated. And as they left, they were stoned by mainly male, white French Canadians. One old man died of a heart attack, but no criminal charges were preferred. What's more criminal than white men coming from Europe, taking the whole, stealing the whole continent, two continents, and slaughtering the people to the extent of 120 millions of Indian, dead, dead Indians that they killed just to take over the land. As the crisis continued, under the gaze of the world's media, the government forces were sent into the Mohawk reservations and tempers reached fever pitch. They've massacred many of our people, you know. Um, our numbers have gotten a lot smaller. We can only hope that the tremendous international pressure that's been put on them will prevail, that reason will prevail, that they will, like us, seek a peaceful resolution to this, and that they will understand, finally, that this is our land, that we have a right to defend our land. At their trial in 1992, three of the Mohawk warriors were imprisoned, but 34 were freed by the jury on the grounds that they did have a right to defend their land. It was a choice, said an eyewitness, between civil war or a longer journey to work, and the Quebec government chose civil war. Kaibilis are the special crack unit of the Guatemalan army, its chief weapon in the insurgency campaign against the Indians. In Guatemala, the Indians still constitute the majority of the population, but the country is ruled by a white elite backed by the US with overwhelming military power. And a ferocious guerrilla war has gone on here since the coup of 1954. Juan Tun and his family are refugees from that war. At that time, some men came into our village. Maybe you would call them subversives. They came in a truck from Chisek and stayed a while. They gathered together everyone in the village and they talked to us. They told us everything they had been doing. It's nothing to us, we said. 
We didn't want to know what they were doing. We gave them a drink of water and some medicine. But our neighbors said, ah, look at them. They are guerrillas, since they gave them water. And that was our great sin. The government's response to the guerrillas in the highlands was to burn their villages to the ground. In Juan's village, Semoy, 34 Indians were murdered. We were in the village in our houses and we heard the army was coming. So we ran away and hid in some rocks and in some tree trunks. But some soldiers came in another way and they found us. There were 26 of us. First they took three of us and they asked, which of you are guerrillas? We said, there are no guerrillas among us. But the army grabbed these people and with their machetes, they slashed their heads and hands. Then they said to me, who is your father? And they cursed me, you whore, they said and they cut me across the breast and slashed my head and hand. It's estimated that at least 40,000 Indians were killed by the counterinsurgency operations of the Guatemalan army in the 1980s alone. In the face of army atrocities, many Indians were forced to flee into the forest, where they formed communities in resistance, which still exist in the remote hinterland of the country. They were seeking us all the time, and our crops were a sign that we were there. We kept going, but it was hard and bitter. As soon as we cleared and planted, the army patrol came and cut it down. We would plant and they would cut it down and leave it to rot. And if any of us tried to retrieve some corn, they would shoot us. We were dying of hunger. That's how they thought they would kill us. We realized we couldn't go to get any corn, so we would just bear our hunger. Sometimes we went eight days and nights without eating. Babies like this one would be crying because they were hungry and thirsty. We would gather leaves from a big tree to catch rainwater to give the little ones something to drink. Two of our children were born in the forest. After eight years, Juan and his friends were forced by starvation to come out of the forests and give themselves up to the Bishop of Coban, a friend of the Indians. They survived. But still today, the army, with its network of model villages, holds down the Indian population with an iron fist.
But the Indian experience in the 20th century does have its success stories. In Panama City, the Kuna people dance their traditional dances in a public square in front of government buildings, free men and women. A successful revolt in 1925 brought them a kind of autonomy. The Kuna live on the shores and coral islands of the Caribbean coast of Panama. In the 1920s, the Panamanian government introduced a series of laws to try to force them to abandon their old way of life. They weren't allowed their traditional dance or costume. They were forbidden to fish the way they'd always done in the past. Public meetings were banned. And so too, even, was their homemade beer. This was what sparked the revolt of 1925. And every year now they hold a public festival in which they reenact, at times all too realistically, the brutal treatment which provoked the rising. To show today's young how their freedom was won. <laughs> The whites put an end to the unity of our people. They told the Indians what was to be done. Then they destroyed our houses. There was already a dancing club, and the whites said, we are going to teach the girls how to dance our way. They chose the younger women. If any of them did not obey, they would break their nose ring so they couldn't wear it anymore. They would cut the beads off their arms and legs. To do this, they would use very sharp scissors and hurt them too. When their parents complained, they arrested them and threw them in jail. They would tie their feet and hang them upside down and beat them. Nobody listened to their protest and they forced our daughters to dance. So our parents decided to revolt. Every nation in the world fights for its land and its freedom. Every creature that God created knows how to fight, and I have that right. I'm an Indian, a person. I have an Indian's heart, and I have reasons to fight. At James Bay and Hudson Bay in Canada, the Cree people are engaged in a different kind of struggle. They're using the media to fight against a massive hydroelectric scheme built on their hereditary lands by the Quebec government. This here is the, was the site of the, the first rapids in this river. Traditionally, it was a gathering area for the Crees, like in the summer months, to, to fish. Uh, people would gather here in the summertime and fish, and I remember that 
When I, when I first moved back in 72, we used to come up here too in the summertime and be with uh, different families who were fishing and just uh, camp out here. The traditional livelihood of the Cree was in fishing and trapping. The new development has inundated 15,000 square kilometers of their hunting grounds. In the months of August or September, people would gather here and feast before they go to eat their respective uh, hunting territories. You know, before the people go inland, they used to paddle up the river here. You know, it's, it's sad to, to see this, this, this river destroyed. You know, a, a whole river system that's six, seven hundred kilometers long, you know, three, four hundred miles long is totally destroyed. And uh, no, who knows what, the, what, what, what's carried in that water. You know, and all this mercury and all that, and it's disgusting. You should see the fish in the reservoir. They got scabs all over their bodies now, you know. It's totally horrendous what they're doing. You know? Just uh, obscene. Rather than just sit back and wait for somebody to try and do something, I've been involved in the resistance to the Great Rail River project, you know, for about two years now. And, uh, creating an awareness is good, but start doing something about it is something else. We, the young men and women band members of the Chesapeake Band, wish to express our concerns regarding the continuous disrespect of our traditional laws and Aboriginal rights by the governments of Canada and Quebec. We have seen the deterioration of our culture and our traditional lifestyle. We have experienced and witnessed the destruction of our homeland and animals we survive on in our most productive game habitat. We have seen the land flooded, trees destroyed, the rivers and lakes polluted. We cannot stand by and let this happen again. We wish to take action and protest this intrusion on our ancestral lands where we have lived since time immemorial. Through intense political and environmental lobbying, the Cree have managed now to put the next stage of the project in doubt and preserve at least part of their old hunting grounds. In spite of what has happened to us, we have survived. We have survived as a people. We are descendants uh, of people who withstood terrible onslaughters, but we survive, we survive because we know who we are, that we're hunters, we're fishermen, we're trappers, that we've lived off the land, we protected the land, and we know our history, and, uh, and we survived because we adapted. But adaption in itself has come so fast in, in the James Bay Cree territory that we have not time to adapt. No other society has developed so fast. When other societies take 100 years, we did it in 20 years. We haven't given time for the land to heal, for the animals to know their migration roots. And yet, the onslaught continues. Give you, on one hand, a right to continue a way of life to hunt fish and trap, and you take it away again because you want to build more dams. You want to divert more rivers. The madness doesn't stop, but our struggle continues. We did fine until Columbus arrived. Um, for 5,000 years, we lived here. Uh, we were doing just fine. But today, every aspect of our life is, is ruled by the government today. You practically, you practically cannot go to the bathroom unless you fill out five forms, sign three others, and have your picture taken. 
I mean, that's how bad it is. When you look at the various pieces of legislation and uh, all the rules and regulations that have been passed supposedly good, supposedly for the good of the, of the uh, Indian, do not recognize that this Indian is an individual, that he is a person, that he has the same desires, the same needs as everyone else. He hurts, he cries the same way and over the same things. 500 years later, they're still debating whether we're human or not. Except 500 years later, they're careful not to say it. We hear of other nations, our brothers in South America, slowly losing their homeland. Rainforests are disappearing. When are they going to stop? When everything is flooded, and if not flooded, when every square inch of land is under concrete? When? Meanwhile, the Ica gather on the Guatapuri River in Colombia to pray for the souls of their murdered leaders to rest in peace to send their spirits to the mountain peaks of Chundwa, the land of the Eternal Mother. At its heart, their spirit world is shared by all the Indian peoples of the Americas. And despite the suffering they have undergone, it's still alive today, and as the Ica believe, still has a future as well as a past. The whites believe that the Indian lives without thinking of anything, merely occupying a space. And by doing away with Indians, they will become owners of all the land. By just listening to what they say, one notices that they have forgotten their entire duty to Mother Earth. If the younger brothers do away with us, they will not be able to defend themselves alone in the world. Mother Earth does not discriminate between who is an Indian and who is a white. In the universe, there is only one Earth, and we are all her children. We are all brothers and sisters, and we all must take care of her. <laughs> 